So the NEC Technical Institute was founded in 1997. It would have been a trust deed between the Atlantic LNG Company and the government of Trinidad and Tobago. And through that trust deed, they would have formed the National Energy Skills Center. So as I said, we were initiated through a trust deed. We provide tertiary level education, two-year diploma programs that have been accredited by the Accreditation Council of Trinidad and Tobago. And we partner currently with Red Deer Polytechnic out of Alberta, Canada. Now, this relationship with Red Deer Polytechnic started in 2011, where we would have been really accessing the Alberta curriculum at that time and writing Alberta exams. That would have transcended over the years to 2020 when we, we got to our, our affiliation agreement with Red Deer Polytechnic. That is, that is now a partnership that is dual certification between both institutions. So I think over the time that is really has been an accomplishment by the institution from 2011 now to 2020 when we signed the agreement and continued the agreement into 2023. So our blended course design as we continue this particular course and all of our suite of programs to the diploma program, full courses are full courses, 18 full courses of 90 hours each that you get six credits for, and the six courses of 60 hours each that are project courses. So how we arrange our training is the students will go through full courses that take both the theoretical and the practical concepts together. But at the end of every three courses, we have a practical course that brings everything together. It means that whatever you practice during the period, you uh, actually get to actually do it and reinforce it in the fourth course in every single uh, course, every single academic year. So there are 18 full courses, six project courses. And of course, there's a blend for the full courses. And the blend is determined by the, project, by the course objectives and the course learning outcomes. That helps us to determine what the blend is going to be. So our course design is broken up into online training, online asynchronous, and of course, in-campus and workshop classes. So the online section tries to deal with underpinning knowledge. All of the concepts that the students would have to know, is we try to focus that in the online. Online asynchronous has a dual purpose. One, we want the students working on their own, as well as bringing those concepts together, getting you ready for the in-campus and the workshop sessions. And of course, we have, a, we have an assessment methodology where we have three types of assessment for coursework, you have group assignments, individual assignments, and of course the competency hands-on that they have to do. And then we have a final exam. They come together to form the students' six credits at the end. Through the administration of online exams in 2018, so remember we had an, a, a partnership with Red Deer Polytechnic, and in that partnership they came every three times a year to run the exams. That changed in 2018, and that was our introduction to online training, because they decided they're not going to come down anymore. We're going to do those exams online. And that's our first foray into online. It was boosted in 2020 by the pandemic. As all of us know, we were challenged in 2020. And we had to find solutions. And that helped us to find our solution because we were familiar with the online environment, though not totally embedded into it. The use of Blackboard, the Blackboard system from Red Deer Polytechnic, because our license goes through them, allowed us to be able to access Blackboard. And we continue to use it today. And coming out of COVID, the benefits of online, with students not having to travel, they having increased opportunities to collaborate online, as well as the access, because you had access 24-0 to your content. That allowed us, that made us realize we needed to continue this blended initiative beyond COVID into now our full-time program. So the theory that we use behind this. And very often we say TVET does not use theory, but that is not the case for us. Because we had to look at what we were doing and say, how are we going to do this? Now, we know TVET is usually behavioral. But we wanted to take a constructivist approach to this. And John Dewey talks about learning by doing. And that is what we really wanted to do. And we embedded the features of constructivism into what we do. Can we continue? So what did we want to do? Active cognitive engagement. How are your students continuously using their minds? Because you can't deliver passively a conducive learning environment. Because the online environment, as well as the environment where students are coming to the workshop, has to be set up in the right way if you actually want active cognitive engagement. And the context. I had a welding instructor have students doing padding lines. I don't know if you know what padding is. So the students were just running padding lines on a piece of plate, and the student was upset because the instructor said to him, three lines good, the next seven, they're no good. And he said, but are these three good? He said to him, yes but it's the entire product is not good. 
and the student didn't understand why, because context was missing. He needed to understand why he was doing what he was doing, because if he doesn't know why, it's going to create a challenge for him. So it's important for us in constructivism to create that level of context. And this would have led us into how we do things. So that meant that we were going into active learning. We were going into self-directed learning. That is what we really wanted to do. So we took a learner-centered approach. Usually, we're teacher-centered in TVET. I don't know if everybody else is like that, but where I'm where at the NESC, we were very, very teacher-centered. Well, now we've changed. Thank God for COVID, thank God for the online blended system. We've changed our learner-centered approach. And that allowed us to bring in active learning, bring in self-directed learning into our programs. I see some people shaking their head, I understand. Maybe we're behind the ball a little bit. <laughs> yeah, can we go forward? And of course, as I said, self-directed learning. So this would have allowed us then to move into how are we going to do it? What is our tool? And that's what we're going to talk about next. So our instructional design looks at a particular model to be able to do it, the ADI model. And I don't know how much of you are familiar with the ADI model. Analyze, design, develop, implement, and evaluate. And the ADI model has helped us to be able to advance our training and look at our content that was not online. We were in textbooks. So we use the ADI, ADI model to be able to move forward. And the ADI model, as you know, created by Florida State, a, me a method for developing and restructuring our courses and our learning activities. As I said, we were textbook based and we needed to move our stuff online. We then needed to clarify what it is we want. How do we clarify our outcomes and our learning objectives? Using the model, we will be able to do that and I will show it to you. And of course, it was a method for assisting and assigning what resources will go where. Yeah? That allowed us and we were thinking about it. How are we going to do this? and we looked at Vygotsky's, Vygotsky's Zone of Proximal Development and Scaffolding. Because you need to know where is my student now, where do I want my student to be, and what are the steps I'm going to use to get the student across the zone. And that's where the scaffolding came into. So we looked at Vygotsky's uh, Zone of Proximal Development, and of course took a scaffolding approach to move students across the divide. So out of this, came the instructional design tool. This was developed by my department in 2021 as a means of us being able to design, do the first three elements of the ADI model, which is analysis, design, and development. And what we did is we started off with what does the student know in the analysis? What is the knowledge that they're coming with? And we identified the previous knowledge, either formal previous knowledge, as in courses that they would have done, or what were the entry requirements. That helped us to establish where are my students and what is, his, what is the ZPD that I'm going to get them across. Using that, our teaching objectives is the scaffolding. How are we going to bring them across? What are the elements? So if the, if the objectives are high level objectives, how do we start from the low objectives, bringing them across the divide? And then, in the analysis, you determine what are the resources that you're going to need to be able to do this. So we had to find in the design methods of achieving those learning outcomes that we described. What is it that we want? Identify what that assignment at the end is going to look like, and then walk that assignment backwards. And then you identify, you apply the blended model. What is going to go online? What is going to go asynchronous? What is going to go in the workshop? And you design accordingly. And that is how we would have actually come up with the blend for the course that we were treating with. And of course, as I said, determine what are those assessments and learning activities that you want your students to do and we had very rigid schedules and instruction methods because our instructors were not allowed to really deviate from the methods that we had set up. And of course, we had two forms of assessment. Do the practical assessment, write the exam. Pass, you get your credits. That has, as you would have seen the model before, that has changed. So, specifically for the Diploma Electrician Program and Course Electrical 6001. So our electrical program looks at electricians in the context of having the knowledge, skills, the competence specific for domestic environment, the commercial environment, as well as the industrial application. And we must always adhere to local and international um, standards and codes. The alternating current and circuit, alternating current circuit properties course looks at 
So it's connect and analyze our AC circuits involving capacitors and inductors. Thank you. Let me move a little quicker. So learners for electrical 6001, there were 124 students in this class. And we had our general requirements for the students to be in the class that would have determined what their prior knowledge is. The standard age group was 17 to 25. Three CXC, CSEC subjects, maths, English, and IT or any science subject. But we also accepted students with different qualifications through an in-person interview as well as an entrance exam. That meant that persons who may not have had the academic qualifications could still get into the program. And for this particular course, students had prior knowledge of circuits, inductors, and capacitors from a previous course. So that's how we look at what did they know before. So we created what is called an NID, that's the NES Instructional Design Template. So from September to December, our instructors, our faculty, and the SME would have spent time going through the prior knowledge, what is the ZPD, creating that scaffolding, mapping the learning objectives to the most suitable mode of delivery, what should go online, what needs to go in campus, what can be asynchronous, and of course, the design and development of all the course materials that would have been needed to run the program. That got us to the 50% blend. That got us to our medium blend. Saying, okay, half the program is going to go online. And why is it online? Because we needed to develop that underpinning knowledge that was needed. We needed to spend more time strengthening that knowledge. And we felt that online was the best place to do it with the tools that we were going to use. And of course, we wanted to introduce the competence. And that's where multi-sim, which is a, a simulation software, was used to bridge the gap between what is happening in the online class and what has to happen in the workshop. So they were designing circuits online in the online, set, in the online areas, then moving into the workshop sessions. And of course, we needed to make sure that they had the cognition for going forward, because previous courses needed this AC circuits course to be able to move us forward. And that's how we got to our medium blend. So you just get a quick look at it, because I know I need to move on. So it would have been 45 hours spent in online and 45 hours spent in the workshop. Forgive me for the next slide. It was not meant to hurt your eyes. It was just to give you a, a look of the tool that we use. So don't even bother to try to read it. I know you can't. <laughs> it was just so you know how comprehensive the tool was that we used to get to this point. Can we go forward? Mr. Tony, can I just mention that you have five more minutes Thank for you. your presentation? Thank you. No problem. Thank you. So use of technology, Blackboard, the Blackboard LMS, all the content from our PowerPoints, all, all our course content was uploaded to Blackboard. We had group individual and competence assessment and the rubric also uploaded to Blackboard. Access to content and assignments prior to, and it's very important, if you want self-directed learning, and I show, I'm sure you know that, you need to give students information before. So all of the content was loaded before, and the Blackboard Collaborate would have been used for the online classes. In terms of multi-SIM, multi-SIM was used to create those circuits, so it was a free version that we, we provided faculty and students with, so you don't always have to spend money. These tools are available online, and we created activities that simulated circuit design and connection and analysis. What were our challenges? The first challenge was devices. 40% of our students did not have laptops or tablets. They were on their mobile phones. So what did we do? At one point, we had to bring students in campus, set up multi-SIM on, on campus, on the systems on campus, and for those activities, bring these students online. Even though that kind of limited the benefits of online, it's, we still had to do it for our students who were using their mobile phones and could not use multi-SIM on their phones. Copyright restrictions posed a bit of a challenge because we could not move content directly online. So what did we do? That's where the scaffolding took place. That's where the assimilation of all the information in the textbooks were moved into the PowerPoint presentations using that UDL principle, that universal design principle of varying methods of delivery. And finally, faculty often went back because you're so used to teacher-centered practices that you kept doing it. What did we do? We enrolled all our faculty. Everyone was enrolled in a program on e-learning instructor, on those um, learner-centered practices for them to be able to change. What were the outcomes? It wasn't good at the beginning, I can tell you that. 13% achieved our passing score of 70. Yes, our passing score is 70, because we think you need to know 70% of the content to be found at least competent. Further evaluation of what was happening, we had to look at our resources. 
what was the student feedback, what were the faculty met methods and resources. Getting resources is not the issue. It's moving the resource from the warehouse into the classroom. That tends to be our problem. And then we said, okay, this is not enough. We need to go further. So we've specified now the Kirkpatrick model for evaluation for all our diploma programs. And that is being rolled out as we speak. And that, I hope I, I will say within the five minutes, is the end of my presentation.